So hello, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Juliet Haysom. I'm an artist and I teach within the foundation and undergraduate programs at the AA. Um, so this series on fabrication um, is set up to explore the relationship between designing and making and between designers and makers. Um, the AA regularly hosts events in which um, architects describe their work, but I think it's perhaps more unusual to hear directly from the fabricators, builders, and or makers who produce their designs for them. So this series aims to redress that balance a little bit and to hear from both designers and makers on a more or less equal footing in order to better understand their collaboration and the politics, poetics and practicalities that can define this kind of exchange. So this is the first in a series of three conversations. Um, next week, Peter Ballantyne will be talking about what we're talking about where uh, Donald Judd's fabricator between the 1960s and the 1990s. Um, on Monday, the 1st of February, Fenella Collingridge and Darren Bai will discuss their work as associate designer and master builder of Walmer Yard, um, which was completed in 2016. Um, but first of all, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Amin Tanahel and Pierre Bedeau. Um, Amin is an architect. Um, born in Berlin, he's based in London, where he now practices architecture as one of the founding partners of group work. The practices projects have been widely published and are characterized as narrative, narrative and tectonically driven. Amin has taught and still writes on architecture, is on REBA National and International Award Committee and advises pension funds on sustainable investments. Pierre Bedeau uh, has been a stonemason for 30 years. He left in 1988, working in restoration. Um, he developed an interest in contemporary architecture and after meeting with a structural engineer in 2009, embarked on the research and development of a new method of mineral construction. For 10 years, he's worked at the Stonemasonry Company, designing stone stairs and structures using techniques such as post-tensioning and discrete steel reinforcement. Pierre believes that the survival of the stonemasonry profession depends on re-establishing communications between professional men and women, engineers and architects. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Pierre and Amin now, um, but just to let you know, at the end of the conversation, if you have um, any questions, please use the raise your hand function, or if you can't use a mic, um, you can add your question into the chat, which isn't um, viewable by everybody, but Manager, who's kindly um, looking after this process, will look through those and be able to work through your questions. Okay, so without further ado, um, i hand over to um, Amin and Pierre to talk about their work. Hi, nice to, nice to see you all. Pierre, are you, are you going to start? No, you, you start, you start, Amin. Okay, start. all right, I'll start. Uh, bear with me, everyone. Um, it's got to work out how to do this mayor business and uh, make sure you can all see it. Right. All right, I think we've only got minutes as opposed to hours, so I'll just jump straight in. Uh, first time we came across structural stone or wanted to use structural stone was with a stone staircase in a, in a sort of standard refurb of a, of a family house. Uh, some of you all know that um, um, uh, during the 80s, Price and Myers rediscovered how those Georgian, what appeared to be magical in Georgian staircases, how they work. So the, the way they work is that they're partly cantilevered into the wall, but actually what they're doing is resting on the next step down. So that's what's called a part cantilever, part reciprocal staircase, taking its load down to the ground. And this avoids uh, a lot of structure, a lot of steel work and a lot of structure in the, in the wall itself. Um, and obviously it makes the, the stone much lighter. Now the problem with um, uh, um, spiral or helical stone staircases is a lot of wastage because what you're doing is cutting a step out of a block and then losing 50, around 50% 50 of the rest of the stone. But today, of course, we've got plenty of CAD software that can be translated into, um, into machinery, stone masonry machinery, that then cuts the, um, the stone more efficiently and you have zero wastage. So the, the key here is that the stone is not just being cut on a diagonal, but it's actually a twisting diagonal. And we did this here with drills and then just splitting it and allowing the, uh, the finish on the underside of the stair to remain that, that drill cutting. Um, because it kept, went from a basement up to the top of the building, it then uh, it sort of uh, spoke of the idea of coming from subterranean. So we're using, using the material itself, its method, method of cutting as part of the sort of narrative of the building itself. 
one of the things we discovered while we were in the stonemason's yard was how these blocks come in. Very large blocks uh, of stone, uh, clasped, drilled, split. So there's three types of uh, method of taking the stone out of the quarry, especially when it's sedimentary. It's called natural cleavage across, natural cleavage across the sedimentary layer, drilled cutting, and then saw cutting. Uh, now, Pierre is a French stonemason in France. Uh, they, uh, they still teach stonemasons how to work with structure. Uh, stone is superstructure. While in this country, we, 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 we've dropped that, I guess, for the last three generations. And it's mostly decoration and restoration. Now, uh, cutting stone, uh, uh, they, then Pierre will elaborate on this. Cutting stone is effectively called stereotomy. The idea of how you take a drawing and project that onto a piece of stone and cut it. Uh, and then specifically, in this case, uh, uh, again, to take the load pass down to, down to ground level. So before uh, we discovered reinforced concrete, the challenge was how do you make stone span large distances when you don't have big pieces of stone or big pieces of timber? And eventually, and this is um, on the right-hand side, you'll see um, a, a, a 17th century engineer called Joseph, I think it's Joseph Abel, or horribly pronounced, um, uh, 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 who, who came up with this idea of cutting stone into small pieces, segments, which again, reciprocally loaded will be a flat arch that take, takes the load to the, to, the, to, the, to the edge walls. On the bottom right, you'll see the town hall in Arles, which again is um, 17th century, towards the end of the 17th century, which is effectively a flat soffit. And there, small pieces of stone are interlocked and take their load path to the, to the columns on the edges. And this is, of course, how we build in stone today. So if, if we're asked to build in stone, uh, what we understand is how to create veneers and clip them into place. Um, and with our knowledge of... Um, of, our, of that staircase, when we first were asked to look at stone, we asked ourselves the question, why are we doing that? Why can't we just use large stone blocks, as it were? Um, so, Clarkenwell Close. Uh, Clarkenwell Close is um, uh, conservation area number one in Islington. It sits outside the city walls. Its original buildings were, were put up um, after the Norman invasion, so 11th century. Two abbeys uh, on our side specifically was a, as a nunnery. South of that was the Knights, uh, the, uh, the Knights of St. John. All structures were mostly, the, the formal structures are all limestone because there's actually small limestone quarries in the area. The rest of the structures in our site specifically was uh, uh, timber stables and servants' quarters as part of the limestone nunnery. The, the, the local site, uh, Clarkenwell, uh, as you, some of you might know, because it's outside the city walls, uh, uh, often had slightly more relaxed uh, rules. It was, became the area of pamphleteering and uh, radicalism. Uh, 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 the nunnery itself was uh, uh, dissolved by Henry VIII, specifically the Duke of Norfolk, who turned it into his palace. Oliver Cromwell then dissolved the monarchy and uh, took the land and built himself a brick palace. His, he, after, after, he was, after the monarchy was restored, his brick palace was destroyed, new buildings went up, London industrialized. Uh, William Morris built a, a printing press there and uh, created the 20th century press for which Karl Marx and Lenin uh, uh, either wrote or used the press for their rational language papers. And still today, it's the start of the May Day, May, May the 1st March. So not a lot left of the nunnery, lots of incremental building and uh, destruction. Our first challenge was what do we build on the site? Uh, do we allude to what used to be literally on the site or do something else? We took the first option, which was to ask Web Yates to use one of their uh, parametric self-learning artificial intelligent bit of software where you, where you seed it with the idea that there's a load bearing timber frame structure except in this case, metal, where you take the typical uh, 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 um, amount of metal or rather metal frame and all its curtain walling and you tell it, how do we um, do that as, as if it was a, a, an external frame in timber and use less metal. So ultimately, uh, you'll see there in its modulation, um, it ended up using something like 30% less metal than a classic um, steel frame structure. This is all very well received. The back of our minds, we thought, well, if it's not well received, we always have the stone option. Well, 
in the end, uh, while it was received well by planners, the new conservation officer absolutely hated it and asked us to go for stone. So we thought, well, we have no prejudice against any particular material. I'm quite happy to take up the challenge of stone. Let's take a step back, visit the quarry with Pierre and uh, talk to quarry masters about the type of stone. There we are, 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 we can quickly find out how the stone is extracted fairly inexpensively nowadays. And if it doesn't come out cleanly, still some hand tooling. There are the three basic types of finish that result from extracting stone. So nothing more is done. And occasionally you'll find a quartz pocket or an ammonite shell in there. That's us testing how, that's, how uh, columns and beams come together. And then if it's an excess skeleton, how a metal boss within that goes back to the floor plate. And then on site then how the floor plates are, are, are cast, left on temporary props until the um, uh, excess skeleton, surrounding excess skeletons lift into place and the whole thing is deep propped. Ground floor, two party walls uh, are acting as our restraint and slowly as you go up the building, the excess skeleton wraps around the, the, the envelope. That's a detail there. Uh, so you can see there how the metal pocket is just squeezed between column, uh, two columns and two beams. And then there's a, 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 a male and female fixing, one's cast into the slab already, and then bolted together in a nylon bar between them that, that creates a thermal um, break. And then a fairly, in, uh, a fairly efficient hermetically sealed uh, thermal envelope that's part vent panel, part um, uh, glazing. That's the context. So um, the context is essentially all post-war. So what you're looking at is entirely post-war construction. And that was really our challenge. We didn't want to, despite the fact that it's conservation area number one, we thought, well, uh, uh, responses to conservation areas shouldn't be um, the literally skin deep um, uh, uh, representation of what we, what conservation officers often think is, um, is a, 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 more to res, a response to context. And these are all, whether it's 70s or 80s, literally skin deep representations in, um, in brick hung from steel or con uh, concrete frames. And our challenge was, well, how do we work with um, our stonemasons to, um, to, to, to build in a way that had been done in the past, specifically limestone on the site, the original buildings, pretty much like the Normans did. So if some of you won't know, the Normans innovated the idea of building in a limestone by taking a limestone out of a quarry while it's still wet, very soft to carve, um, and cutting it and creating their fortifications. Uh, so the stone locks in and after six months or so, it effect effectively cal calcifies and becomes incredibly strong, so which is why they're part of, part of the reason why they're so successful in Northern France and then obviously in England as well. Ultimately, those three types of finish, our quarry master and uh, our, 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 our stone mason Pierre, um, uh, allowed us to keep the, the crust, the natural sedimentary layer, the, the fossils, and then the saw cutting. Because ultimately, if you decide that everything you want to see is, is smooth, it means you're cutting all that off. Apart from expending more energy, it's actually a lot of wastage, a lot of wastage of material. So our challenge was to say, if we allow the skill of the quarry master and the stonemason to be expressed in the building as our contemporary 21st century dressing in stone, it's not neoclassical or Gothic, what is that? That's using their method of cutting, extracting, leaving the natural finish, the spirit of the stone in, in, in itself. But should it be random, there needs to be some control. So they gave us an opportunity to turn the stones by 180 degrees, but that's about it. So it's, it, it looks natural and if you like organic and chaotic, but actually there's some control in there. And a ground level, some what Edward R. Ford calls the um, autonomous details uh, um, allude to um, what used to be on site, the nunnery, uh, the past as it were. Interior, I'm gonna rush through this really because uh, I'm sure you've got lots of questions and some of you might've seen us before. A blue green roof on the top. Uh, and then the, uh, with Pierre and Web Yates, the next challenge was well, if we've built a ground plus five, can we build a ground plus 10? So planning approval for this is currently on site. The challenge here is though, for fire purposes, firefighting purposes, the structure needs to have an integrity of 90 minutes or more. And the, what you do then, we, we took the stones to the BRE to test for strength, but also strength under fire. 
uh, and that's um, conditions where it's um, either engaged with the envelope on the corner of the envelope or entirely separate. And what we found is actually limestone has to increase in size to, able to be able to cope for that length, or you could choose basalt. So in this case, we took a basalt, whoops, we took a basalt stone, uh, which can remain the same sort of size as the limestone that we've got here at Clerkenwell and, and uh, have its fire integrity for, for longer. The other thing we learned on that project is, or we've learned from Clerkenwell, is why not do the entire internal structure in CLT? And the combination, as you'll see from this study for the building center, which we then decided, well, how high can we go? And this one we just took up to 30 stories. Um, uh, we find that actually the combination of stone and timber ends up carbon negative. So you'll see on the far left, if it's all stone, excess skeleton stone, internal structure, uh, post-tension stone slabs and core, the carbon footprint is less than half if the building was um, a concrete frame and, and obviously, uh, well, a lot less than, um, you know, less than a quarter than if it was a steel frame. However, if you then combine the stone excess skeleton with an internal timber structure, so say CLT floor slabs, it's actually the whole building is carbon negative. It's obviously um, uh, uh, you're sequestering carbon with your timber. So negative, you could do the equivalent uh, concrete frame uh, sister building and you'd still end up being negative. So the, the lesson we learned apart from um, Apart from uh, uh, the advantages of, um, the, the, let's have a thought experiment and suggest that we all, as architects and engineers and clients, only build in timber and stone from now on, from today onwards, what you'd actually be doing is uh, uh, creating, a, instead of a, a carbon emitting industry, you'd actually be creating a carbon absorbing industry. And if you use um, uh, uh, Professor um, Trowther of ETH, ETH ETH Zurich's um, um, uh, study within a hundred within a hundred years or less than a hundred years would be at, at pre-industrial carbon levels. The other thing we found with uh, Jackson Coles was that building in stone alone is cheaper than steel or concrete, and then building with CLT in stone is cheaper still. So if there are any clients out there, or if you have to persuade any clients, go to Jackson Coles. I think you actually can download this from the building center. These are obviously good arguments to persuade them. I think I'm going to finish there because otherwise I will ramble on uh, and let Piet take over. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, some nice pictures, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, please, please take over. We can always come back to these later. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, Juliet, do you want me to to start? Um, so let me see if I can share my screen in a good and efficiently manner. Uh, alors, voilà. Okay, can you see? Yes. Yes, okay. Right, so um, um, my... I've decided, yes, to, to look a bit um, at the way um, I, as a stonemason, uh, managed to um, get, into, <laughs> get into the mind of the architect or, or, or designer. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, let's see if I can do that. Yes. So, I, um, I've been very lucky. I, uh, in, my, in my youth, my parents used to uh, uh, gently drag me to Greece and Italy and uh, being able to sample the, the beauty of uh, the old uh, Greek and Roman world. And uh, because one, my name, Pierre, means meaning stone, and uh, this uh, visit in, in this sort of old world, I was fascinated by, the, by architecture and, and of course by, by, by the stone. So as, um, as, as I became a, a teenager, and uh, needed to feed myself and very not being very good at uh, academically, I decided to, to go to something that was always fascinated me, which was building with stone and of course, one day maybe, you know, work on cathedral and Gothic cathedral and so on. 
So um, I became an apprentice, um, then a trademan. Uh, I, I belonged to a, a guild, a uh, brotherhood um, of uh, the in, in France, uh, where we teach the the art of carpentry or stone masonry or any other craft that transform uh, or repurpose a natural material. And uh, for ten years, I I learned my my trade uh, with some very very quite quite still very young uh, tradesmen but full of um, full of enthusiasm for their their work so 10 years later this uh, bath where i was uh, bathing uh, uh, when i was a child in olympia um in fact uh, 10 years later i i worked with with designers famous designers and so on and and work stone uh, and give whatever shape uh, designers or architect want and um at this very moment in time, and this especially in in, um, in the bath, um, <laughs> it's um, a bit like an eureka moment. I, I just started to think that there was something missing with the um, uh, in the architecture uh, in 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 our trade, and it was um, to, to 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 push our trade. It was to to get closer to the people like designers or architect and try to understand how their mind work and what's the language and, and vocabulary. So here, here me carry on my little um, my little work as a as a as a as a, as a stonemason. And um, it happened that uh, more than 12, 13, 14 years ago, I one of the first stone staircases we were doing, I needed um, an engineer, an engineer, and I met uh, Steve Webb that you can see uh, sporting a, a very elegant beard. And um, as as I was discussing with him engineering, he, he got me introduced to Amin. And um, and so once once upon a time in a pub, um, we started to, to 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 learn about each other, to want to try to to see how we could uh, use stone in a more um, structural uh, setting. So for a young architect, uh, tip number one: go to the pub. Uh, if if I uh, if I shall say that, so that uh, they can meet people. Because of course, all this say all this fifteen cc, fifteen clack, and well close fifteen cc as we call it. It's it's all about um, really uh, an interest in each other trade, in each other work. So. As as we are all different, like in this wonderful world wall in um, in the south of Italy, as we are all different, we've got all shape and sizes. There is something that I think is very important between um, Steve, which is not part of the talk here, unfortunately, but Steve, myself, and and and, and I mean, is that um, the what we shouldn't forget into a, a masonry wall is that it's not only the pieces of stone; it's the mortar between them. Okay, and the motto between all of us, I think, is um, a, a curiosity, a, a, a desire to learn um, and to understand how things are made. Um, and I think that's that's very much uh, critical to what uh, what happened with uh, 15CC. So, of course, you take um, for that some engineer or, or sometime architect who've got no clue whatsoever in stone, and you've got to go and teach them and and show them what it is about so you can start by the basis um you know what's limestone what is granite what is basalt and so forth so fortunately people like steve and uh and i mean and its team are, are very um as i say very curious they 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 love to see how um where things come from and how they are shaped so uh, to do that um and i think that's that's again it's it's, it's a very I think I mean I mean we might uh, with Juliet later we, we could talk about that but you you need to go and see the place where things are done the workshop the the, the forest where the woods come from or or the stone where the, the the quarry where the stone come from because it's while you while you while you visit that you discover the different texture you can give to a material um you can you can see that as you say on on the very on, on the other uh, this is a quarry in Portugal. You can get very big blocks, but um, then you can go into a south of France other quarry where the setting is totally different. It's it's much more efficient the way they were working there because it's the stone that allow that. Or uh, maybe uh, it could be an underground quarry 
which again has got some other um, uh, constraint. Um, but still, um, you know, I mean, in, in some of the visit of Quarry, uh, he's been visiting quite a lot. He, he start to to get um, a better understanding on how things are extracted and the tools needed. Um, I mean, taught, uh, talked about uh, a, a bit more, and I, I will just browse on um, on that. Is that whatever trade you are going to look at, um, they they've got a certain set, they've got a vocabulary and a certain set um, of uh, of tools. Um, it, it might be as well for shaping uh, the material as well as drawing. Okay, so uh, a joiner doesn't draw like a stonemason. Stonemason doesn't draw like a carpenter's, and, and so forth, or a blacksmith. Okay, so um, what was important as well uh, for for fifteenth lac and well close was to understand the drawings, um, the the way the structure well was going to 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 get uh, articulated on. Um, as I, I will again, you know, um, in fact, uh, I mean, just did talk about the way drawings are done, the way templating as uh, is done, and I uh, I think that could be part of another uh, of another talk. But um, whatever for young architect that might be part of the who might be listening is just that once you've got something in two dimension on a drawing, you need information to put it on a three-dimensional uh, object and that for that you need a um, set of templates dimension and that's go that's that is be that will be done through what we call the setting out okay an, an epure in french something very pure that's got to be all the information needed for the for the construction um as um as i mean was touching on it and as when I visit uh, quarries and workshop with architect, there is always this, oh, that's a big block. Yes, yes, there, there is big blocks. Um, we, especially on the continent where the, the, the geology is a bit more uh, friendly to, to the stonemason and, and the quarry uh, master. And um, by understanding the scale of the stone, uh, how things are done, um, architects are much more are better equipped to to see what sort of design is going to what sort of design can be applied to the to the drawing to the to the building. Um, so sometimes you've got to think that it's the quarry who are going to make the building. The, the way you you the size of the blocks that's going to make the building and not the other way around. Um, so that's my that's my philosophy and what's very much uh, I mean as well. Um, we, 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 you go on site, you, you show them, uh, for example, that in here, this um, 18, 1880 uh, pictures of the, inter, um, the inside of the Opéra Garnier uh, in, in Paris was done over a soft stone. This soft stone is then carved after it's fitted. Okay, that's, that's again our, our vernacular way of working stone. You don't work stone in Yorkshire like you work in, in Portland, like you work it in uh, in the Cotswolds or Bath. Okay, each each um, each time that you look at a stone, um, you need to look at how the, the 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 city next to this stone has been built. Okay, that's 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 very important, and and I think that's uh, that's crucial in in Amin work and his team is that they they, they look at very much closely at what's around a, a quarry now. Um, so, um, of course, not not all tradesmen or craftsmen, craft people are, are how to put it, um, are keen to do this uh, sort of um, artistic ingenuity that we are we are putting in our um, in our structure. We we just love very much uh, breaking the mold, um, going, you know, breaking boundaries. Um, and when we work with, we, we like to work with architects who've got um, a very strong view on, on, their, on the building they want to produce. Uh, the, the, this, it's definitely not all architects uh, that um, have this uh, very personal um, relation with the building they built and, and the structure they built. And, and very much what we liked with Amin is that um, he, he was able to to understand what can be done with stone, but as well as pushing us to look at stone differently. And, and, and I think that's for us, it's it's very refreshing. 
Um, so we we tend to take uh, so for for this work at fifteen Clark and well close we we just had to um, as I say to 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 show around uh, to um, to show the 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 architect team what what can be done. So we we we, we put them outside of their comfort zone, not just looking at cladding uh, in central London, but um, just looking at other things. So here, for example, I mean, that's just a picture to show the, the other path to take, but um, uh, this is a Greek old town in in, um, in the Golan Heights in, in, uh, in Israel. And um, this is just to, to, to show that you know, they, there is another way to look at uh, the architecture through a different um, uh, point of view geographically. Um, and um, as I say, I'm going to to to, to browse quickly here, but uh, it's very important. It, it was very important for uh, for us to show what could be done with the stone that we were going to use for uh, uh, for Clark and Well Close. And the vernacular uh, architecture for this stone is in Lyon. And it was, uh, I think, uh, very interesting for Amin and, and Dominic uh, to see that we could get a big, big stone. You know, on 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 this window, on the um, on this uh, uh, on this shop here on the left hand side, uh, the beam, the stone beam is more or less four four to five meter high. Um, but um, it is interesting to see that, for example, as you get longer stone, you could put the stone in a plate differently on the walls and that even if you look closer you can get uh, a better understanding on the finishes on on the fact that even little little bits of stone are put back into the joint to make it to 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 to, to leave the the stone settling uh, properly um but again you could go and see all the quarries and see all the building and see you know it's a completely different setting it's a softer stone um it's bigger much bigger block with a more rectangular uh, size and so you get a building which is slightly different um we became very uh, interested uh, i mean uh, i share with i mean my my passion for uh, um, for Mr. Pouillon, uh, the great French architect uh, from the end of the 60s, who um, just after the war had the mission to rebuild uh, most of Marseille and some part of Paris. And um, that's very important because um, uh, Mr. Pouillon was uh, taking a view on, on working closely with the, um, the craftsman he was working with. And he was working in, in, the, in the quarry in, uh, with Paul Marceroux, um, which was a, a quarry owner, who just devised all the machine to make the architecture of Pouillon uh, possible. Um, as I say, we, we, we try to show architects uh, even the most amazing structure, like uh, this sort of, uh, uh, on the left-hand side, this uh, Greek, uh, reu Greek people reusing all bits of marble that can, they can lay their hands on and, and build their wall with you know the leftover or the the, the repurposing of, of stone or this amazing uh, one of the biggest uh, stone vault in the world um, somewhere in India, uh, which show as well the scale of the work that can be still done be done in stone. You know that's that's a job that was uh, going on ten years ago. So you know it's it's just to to teach um, things to 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 this um, to architect and uh, something that you don't have to forget is that. For what we teach to the architect, the architect, architect teach us as well. Um, they they get us out of our comfort zone by showing us some some you know some very important architect, uh, contemporary architect, um, of course Scarpa, um, um, Sidza, for example. Just always they're working working with stone, the way they work with stone. So, um, but as well as looking at other sort of materials so that we, we might use stone to maybe emulate what was done in, uh, in concrete. Um, and my, uh, my time spent in, um, uh, in, in, in cities to look at everything in stone, I, I spend it now looking at uh, concrete structure, um, you know, all the, the way these this structures are built. Um, and I think that as well in the relation with, with architect and engineer, it's, it's very important that we carry on getting into the, the, the mind of this uh, of the other, um, and uh, here you see uh, Dominic and uh, Amin conquering the world, um, and uh, one stone at a time. Um, 
and again as they visited they they their vision of the stone starting starting to shift and uh, they thought about why not using this sort of uh, texture um how come how come we spend so much doing doing the splitting is there another way we could use the stone to 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 save energy because uh, i think something we need to be very careful nowadays is that the stonemason just don't make pretty molding but understand as well the the, the cost to the earth and uh, the energy that could be saved in in maybe making stone uh, a bit more simple in the way it's it's um, it's it's fabricated and shaped um and um not only you visit the quarry you visit the workshop um, you because um, you can understand better the process of shaping stone. Um, sometimes we've got architects as we shape a stone, they suddenly realize that the, the soffit of that step that we are shaping, it's much more interesting than the flat one they, they could have. Uh, and they might say, suddenly stop, stop there. It's really what we wanted. Um, and uh, I, I think for, for all the young architect or designer that can listen to us, um, as I say, it's, get out of of course your your um, you know your your classrooms and so on and, and visit a lot more uh workshop just just get get deeper and dig deeper into the um into the the way things are done um and uh i think that's that's crucial the thing you learn as well with working with architect is that everything is how shall i say fluid um, you might start with a certain uh, design and just right in the middle, uh, just because of uh, a new inspiration, you are going to end up with a totally different uh, texture or even sometimes stone. So it's it's something that we learn as well is that uh, the only thing where we know that's the only thing for sure is that uh, there is a lot of things that are going to change on a on a on a on an architect uh, uh, scheme. Um, and to uh, to finish, um, and I've got a few more slides, but um, it's a, it's a back and forth exercise. The you know uh, testing the stone, testing the the, the mock up. Um, it's it's all about tuning the the building. I think maybe I mean we'll talk about that. But we I just find that working with architect you uh, closely with architect. Uh, it's um, you you you've got this exercise of fine tuning the structure or, or the texture, um, and I think that was it's it's very very important this sort of collaborative way that that we've developed at the Stone Masonry Company. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yes, I mean just talked about this mock up and so on and the process of 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 uh, development, as well of course through drawing through uh, sketches and 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 then. We start to develop even with I mean and its team a sort of our own language between between the two uh, the two companies like we've developed our own vocabulary with uh, uh, with Web and Yates engineer. So um, and so in fact uh, after all the easy bit is just the building. Uh, you know, it's the things we've been doing for six thousand years. Um, but uh, the fact of talking to each other, listening to each other, uh, this uh, this desire to learn from each other. Um, I think should be always renewed, and uh, in a way, it's it's the it's the most exciting stuff. So here we are. That's uh, that's done. Gosh, thank you so much. Um, what amazing work! Thank you both. Um, I wonder if I can ask you to expand a little bit, um, particularly on what you were just saying there, Pierre, about the, the vocabulary, because I think maybe um, students or perhaps architects um, who've got experience of working at scale and maybe thinking that the way that will work is through BIM programs, which will tend to standardize a kind of drawing language. So given that you were saying you gave that beautiful example of the slide, um, and I think you said that um, joiners don't draw, draw the same way as a stonemason and they don't draw the same way as a blacksmith. Could you say a little bit more about the way that you develop the drawing vocabulary with Steve Webb as well as part of your projects the, between the three of you? Amin, do you want to answer that first or? Oh, Amin, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to go on too much about it, but I think uh, we are taught as architects to, 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 to begin with pencil and paper, you know, to draw to communicate our ideas um, uh, on, on bits of paper. And I think we get stuck with that um, and graduate and, and start practicing. 
uh, where we believe our drawing will then get translated and can be translated into, into built form. And of course it can, which is partly the reason I think we end up with these products where everything is clad. So ultimately that, that, that slide showing how this um, chap is putting on veneers, clipping on veneers of, um, of stone, it is really represents what architects uh, have been taught and are still taught to do this day, which is you do a two-dimensional, you, you create a three-dimensional drawing and yes, it might be in BIM, but ultimately it's still conceived as, three, uh, as two-dimensional two, two mm -hmm. where we have no real uh, idea of the weight the mass of this, potentially of this stone, and what it's really meant to be doing, you know, structurally what it's meant to be doing. We just represent it uh, as a piece of color, uh, a label, a specification as stone on an elevation. Uh, and then somebody else is there to work it out for us, the structural engineer, the, the, the rest of the design team, and then subcontractors who specialize in facades. So we, we, we get stuck with this idea that the drawing is all. And of course it is important for architects. There's plenty of examples uh, of, of where the drawing is, is the inspiration and should be. Uh, but uh, uh, what, we, what, we, what we tend to forget is the important aspect is that sometimes if you start off with the material itself, uh, and it's part, part of the reason we came unstuck on Clarkenwell is that uh, we decided very quickly that the material itself does the design. So Pierre, <laughs> Pierre and the um, and the the quarry master are effectively driving the design, and we were we had a philosophical outlook that it should be entirely driven by the quarry master and Pierre's team, extracting the stone, and then uh, lifting it into place, and then we end up with what we end up. We've 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 had the case officers tell us. Um, yeah, fine, you know, it's, it's limestone and you're gonna have three different types of finish. And he was fairly relaxed and we were fairly relaxed. Uh, and it was only when one of us decided, you know what, there's three different types of finish was trabiated. Maybe we'll end up with a pattern we don't like. Supposing all the smooth stuff ends up at one end or in another corner and actually looks deliberately set out like that, not, not <laughs> left to the... So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's something that uh, again we with us at the stone masonry company, and uh, it, it's um, <laughs> and I don't want to, to be to be uh, uh, to be rude, but it's it's um, it's the lack of of control that we like in a way with building with. I mean, is that it's it's um, and and that's why I was talking about fluidity. It's 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 really the material and 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 the way we can transform material that are guiding the building. It, it's not we. Um, sometimes we work with architects, and that's that's another challenge. I'm, I'm not I'm not saying it, it's the wrong way, but which com are complete control freak, you know, with with, with going to have a, a ten panel of stone where you've got to have exactly the same hue of color, and um, and they will go mad if there is a little black dot in the middle of one. But um, but as it's another challenge. But I think we still prefer to work with saying. You know, here it is. It's under our feet. In it's it's down to our human mind to to create something with this constraint. Mm. Um, and 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 to go back to the drawing, I, I think what's what's exciting and um, it, is that each trade uh, will design differently because of their material. Um, and and I think sometimes it's don't look only at the way that things are made, but look at the way they are designed by the maker, uh, because they will give you a, a lot of clue. I mean, definitely for I mean, would just suddenly realize, uh, you know, stereotomy is, is such an exciting, exciting um, activity <laughs> in a way. But um, yeah, just, you know, it's not about the making, it's, it's about the drawing and the way the makers are drawing it. Mm. Yeah, I, I wonder also um, if, if I've understood correctly, the first project that you worked on was a, a stone staircase together, the three of you. Oh, no, no, no. It's it's um, it was another venture with with another group of stonemason for for this staircase. Yes, another another French um, stonemason. They they're all they all graduate from the same um, <laughs> companions. Dare I say they all know each other intimately? Right. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, we we'll leave it at that. <laughs> so, so the first project that you worked on, though, then the three—that great photograph of the three of you all looking—that you you presented. Yes. Today, what what was that one? Uh, that was that was uh, that's the, last, the, that's the, the last new project. Stone Age. 
the yeah. new Stone Age, the ah. new Stone Age uh, exhibition. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So, um, so that was more recent, though. So that was the last yes. summer. Yeah. Um, but yeah. the, but I was just wondering because I, I I suppose what I'm what I'm interested in is is it seems like between the three of you, and I'm sorry that Steve's not here. That's my fault, really, for <laughs> pairs of conversations. Um, but it was maybe more appropriate for you. Oh, he's there. He's there. Oh, he is there. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Steve, if you unmute yourself, you can you can join in. Yeah. Hi, Steve. You're on mute. Um, it may be that manager can adjust oh, that. Oh, I see. I see. So um, yeah. But some. Um, okay. I, I was interested oh, in. Um, I'm here. There you go. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Um, I was interested when Pierre um, showed the slide of Caesar and Scarpa, um, because there's one anecdote about Scarpa going to the Venice Biennale with his plasterers um, and enjoying the red of the Rothko and then putting that into the building. And I think probably for a lot of architects and designers, that kind of relationship with a fabricator is, is a sort of dream scenario. Um, that you, that level of trust and, and, you know, when you talked about going to the pub being an ideal way to, you know, develop your relationship. I just wonder how much one project has fed into the next one. It seems like there's a level of scale and um, that isn't just what could be defined by a standard building contract as well. Um, and whether you could talk about how one thing has, how that conversation has evolved from project to project. Steve, do you want to jump in? Well, I, yeah, I guess, um, I mean, we, we got into, we were making wooden versions of stone cantilever stairs in 15 years ago, a very long time ago. So we were making plywood boxes that were kind of stacked on top of each other, like fake stone stairs. And we got, and Pierre came to us and said, well, if you know how to make those out of wood, you know how to design the stone ones. So we started designing stone traditional, uh, traditional stone staircases uh, with him. Um, and then that grew into different kinds of staircases and self-supporting staircases and then by spending a lot of time in the pub, I mean, talking about stone and different different ways of making, and he, I mean, seeing some of the traditional stones there. So this this kind of snowballed from that technology into much bigger, more complicated things. Um, to the point where we've done, you know, quite a lot of technical R and D for post tensioned and reinforced uh, stone and designing buildings with I mean and audacious things. But really, it comes from you know, just kind of, it's a strain of experimentation. One thing leads to another. The ideas bounce between all of us in the pub, especially after we've kind of got reasonably lubricated. <laughs> um, and, um, and yeah, there's definitely, uh, I think, I mean, I mean, I think we all push each other. He pushes us because he's always trying to do crazy and audacious things that are terrifying. Uh, we try and find solutions for it. I think that we, you know, we all think that spur I mean on Pierre's ability to to deliver these things and to really innovate, you know, innovate and not not stay in a very narrow line of uh, of, of safe manufacturing, but to always kind of go out and try the dangerous stuff. I think all of you know, it's, uh, we've all. I think the three of us have got on pretty well on that basis, and I think it's. And I, you know, maybe we would have done that with a different material, different technology. Well, it can't be as a stone mason, but. I've got I, I, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. But so, sorry, no, Juliet, I, I, th I think it's something that um, I think we all like with with each other is, and it was what you just said about spontaneity. Um, and I think it's it's the way that we we all in this sort of relation we can we can give an idea and, and disregard it or make it happen and uh, um, and I think the spontaneity is is a key element of, of this uh, in this uh, close dialogue between each other. Um, I I, um, I I think definitely spontaneity yes and, and fun and 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 we are all we we like to all have fun yes. Great. Um, I've just seen um, managers. Maybe we should go to some of the questions. Um, there have already been some in the chat. Um, one in particular, I, I was wondering about as well. Um, the uh, Emilio writes about the construction of fifteen Clerkenwell Close and about whether it needed, and he, in his words, specialist masons to fit the stones. Um, 
And I wonder, I think, Pierre, your workshop is north of London, but you also talked about all of you visiting the, the quarry and having the quarry master from the, the quarry source in near Lyon producing the stone. I wonder if you can talk a bit more about actually, you know, uh, uh, what your oversight was. Did the, the stones, did you work in the quarry for this project or did all the stone come to your workshop in the north of London? And did you then fit the stone yourself as well or was that uh, contracted? No. No, so we did everything in the house, um, and in fact, the 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 idea of I mean was to um, do as little as possible uh, work on the stone as uh, you know that everything was done at the quarry. So eighty ninety percent of the um, of the project was done in the quarry because 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 of the visit of I mean into the quarry just to say to see oh there is there is three texture I'm interesting. Um, there, there is there is cost as well. You know, you don't want to spend uh, a lot of shaping uh, of, for, for for the creation of this building. So, in fact, except the rebating of the boxes, you know, this connection box that link the exoskeleton uh, uh, to to the uh, to the frame to the to the slabs. Um, except that, eighty percent was done at the quarry by simple um, simple texture and uh, and the fitting. We do everything in house, so it was our team. Uh, fitting, fitting the, um, uh, you know, it was it was fitting stone like you, you fit bits of steel in a way. You know, it's it's a very simple uh, way. Mm. Um, there's another question here that maybe I think is very pertinent um, by C. Poe. Um, for a future stone project, how do you reconcile this intuitive, fluid, spontaneous approach with the English planning system's discretionary and micromanaging tendencies? And I quote. <laughs> <laughs> Any of uh, three of you yeah. want to talk about yeah. that? Yeah, well, obviously we learned that um, uh, you can't rely on one case officer who then leaves and um, you know it's in his mind and then he hasn't translated it. You basically haven't got it all on paper. Uh, so you can't rely on that. Um, uh, and clearly the planning system's not set up to allow things that are completely organic and random. Ideally, it works very well if everybody specifies well in advance manufactured materials where you can guarantee the outcome. Uh, you can write them on a piece of paper and say, it will be this color, it will be this texture, and there'll be no variation or little uh, variation to expectation. So you have to take a, you have to do a lot more work in advance and absolutely get it. Uh, 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 that fluidity allowed uh, to be, um, to, well, allowed somehow in those documents. And that's what we're doing from now on. And most, uh, you know, every time we approach a planning department, they all know us now. Yeah. They know in, know in advance um, what we're asking. Look, if we do want some fluidity here, uh, how are we going to control it? That you guys are satisfied that should one of you be run over by a bus tomorrow, the next person that comes along is not going to scratch his head and think, this is not what I, I, I understand from the drawings. So, yeah, you, have to, you just have to do a bit more work in advance in terms of um, pinning down what you don't want to pin down. <laughs> Um, there's another question relating to um, stone two. This is from um, Rarefield. Um, given the objections to Clerkenwell close, how does this relate to the assumed admiration for architecture built in stone as the highest value? So I think uh, maybe this, I mean, uh, partly why, what, what I think that maybe connects to is this, what you were saying about actually the really letting the stone express itself in raw form, um, and that perhaps um, being a really nice antidote in my view, anyway, to having stone where it's cut so smoothly yeah. that it could be yeah. almost in, indistinguishable from concrete or other kinds of composites. But on the other hand, that it had a lot of objections in build yeah. that shocked yeah. a lot of people. Whether yeah. you've got a, a thought on that? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I mean, we. Um... Obviously, the three of us have worked on it, so we understood what was coming up, uh, what was what was um, coming, uh, uh, being erected, as it were, once the scaffolding came off. But I, I used to take um, other engineers I've worked with in the past, I won't mention their names, and um, uh, and we'd turn the corner onto the road, and they'd, the first thing they'd say, wow, is that, is that, uh, that how did you, how, why did you use um, uh, concrete? Did you bush hammer that concrete? As we got closer, Oh, did you did you split the concrete, explode it, and split it? And as we got closer, you know, I'd stay stum. Uh, uh, as we got closer and closer, and they'd actually see an ammonite shell 
they'd see that the, these these blocks they're not they're not um, there's no post tensioning there's no stainless steel rods they're just literally because we're not in a seismic area are we uh, mm. they're just resting on another like stone hand <laughs> except five six stories tall they go oh my god it's um, it's uh, it's a load bearing exoskeleton of, um, of of limestone so even professionals are unused to it and perhaps uh, as peers as um, I can see peers sitting there and he's he's he, he, he's local. Uh, somebody might want to unmute him, and he can give the. You know, as professionals, we 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 haven't seen this stuff for for a very long time, so it might be a bit of a shock. It might be a bit new. And yes, not every not every site needs to have absolutely the raw stuff that comes out of the quarry. But in our opinion, it's um, it's it's the it's the beauty of the original stone, the spirit of the stone, and uh, highly economical. I.e., you're not spending more time, labor, money, and carbon in then cutting, cutting off all those fossils to then finish it in another way, whether it's smooth or, or some sort of other pattern. So to us, if you, that's partly why we call it the new stone age, is uh, why not celebrate this stuff that comes straight out of the quarry? But also, uh, actually, this is the simplest way. This is literally, as Pierre says, 6,000 years old, this method, of one piece of stone on top of the other. There's nothing, you know, that, that's partly why I showed those stereo, stereotomy examples of the 17th century, yeah, of where they're highly complex bits of geometry, which were do just done with drawings, not CAD, BIM, or, or parametric self-learning bits of software, which we all have now. So the, the, the possibilities are huge, but we've, we're saying, let's just go back, relearn right from first principles, and Clark and Will is that, the first mm -hmm. simplest way of using stone. Now, Piers, give us, a, give us your opinion of, of... Yeah, well, I think um, the cavity wall actually has a lot to answer for, um, because it's not <laughs> the whole thing of having a, a you know, a, just a, a facade of, of one material and then some ties and then some other material even before you think about frames and so on you know cavity walls with all which were a great insulation idea were a sort of structural um <clears throat> uh, compromise what i remember of your building was going past it before the stone arrived and seeing uh these concrete slabs with basically acro props and i i just thought you'd been sponsored by acro i thought it was a whole <laughs> Acro madness, you know, uh, it seemed absolutely insane as if no one could make up their mind about what they're going to put on the outside. And so you, you put all these acros up um, and that somehow you'd been even sponsored by acro. Uh, and instead of knocking on your door and saying, what the f are you playing at? Um, I just walked by and just thought, that, that's mad. You know, that is insane. Um, and it wasn't until the stone went up. Uh, that I must say I was never fooled into think it was concrete. I, I have to say it looked like stone right from the start yeah, um, to my eye. But um, and of course I, I was just flabbergasted, impressed, and amazed because I've have done a stone building and it was it was a facade. It, it, and worse than that, the the one bit that was structural I had made out of on the exterior envelope I had made of concrete because I hadn't even occurred to me we could have bits of stone so huge um, from the quarry. So, yes. yeah, it's shaming, super shaming. And um, uh, but, but, it won't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, I think, I think it's, it's, it's key what you just said um, about uh, this cavity wall and, and this, this accumulation, this sandwich, this, this never-ending sandwich of, of mm. material, which, which, which I think have been built by... Uh, by, by 20 or 30 years of so-called progress on saying, oh, we are going to put another barrier there and another barrier there. And, and, it, and it's, yeah. it's pure madness. I think it's uh, from time to time, we need the sort of reset button where we get set to say, oh, whoa, whoa, <laughs> what mm -hmm. are we doing? Are, are, we, are we just going off course here? And yeah, cavity wall, I think, has a lot to answer. I think yeah. Steve could probably help. Uh, uh, you know, the, ultimately, um, you know, we, most most of us as architects are, are 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 tend to be buffeted by the rest of the design team, the structural engineers, and other members. 
uh, m e engineers, sustainability engineers who tell us, for instance, oh, you, you can't do this without a cavity wall, or uh, uh, how, how are you going to have an exoskeleton? Why would you want to use um, uh, structural stone? Nobody ever does that. Or even the QS, it's prohibitively expensive. And we, we asked all those questions because it's our building. We had the luxury of, of challenging those, those, yeah. um, those assumptions. But Steve gonna... will tell you that most, most engineers are not taught how to use stone. They will still drive architects towards, can you please use a piece of reinforced concrete and hang it? Mm. Yeah. I was actually mm -hmm. going to ask that about um, how much, um, how different this design process was, I mean, with you being the client for the building um, and the kind of risks, even things like the sort of insurance you're able to get or whether there were lots of points of friction because you weren't working in a conventional way. Um, and this maybe links to another question in the chat from Lee McKinley, who asks um, how the panel can expand on the carbon reduction values of stone, but also how to convince commercial clients to use stone honestly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and then I'll let, let Steve go on and on. But uh, I mean, you know, in a good way about uh, the carbon, the carbon, <laughs> carbon and structural advantages. Uh, Yes. Uh, the first question we asked Pierre was, um, uh, can we actually do this in stone, in structural stone? And he looked at us like fools and said, you know, in France, uh, we call it austerity construction. Uh, Fernand Poulon uh, in the post-war period demonstrated that, uh, that rebuilding France after the war, all that housing, was cheaper to do in load-bearing stone than obviously, you know, the progressive new um, modernism and its concrete or steel frames, reinforced concrete or steel frames. So he tested it, we tested it, he came back with a price and it was cheaper than the concrete and steel frame clad in stone. And as he says, fireproofing it, waterproofing it, insulating it, weathering it, putting window openings in and having to weather all those win windows. So what people forget is don't go to the QS and say, is my stone structure cheaper than a concrete frame? It's about because the QS's cost manual is several chapters and it's subdivided into substructure, superstructure, secondary structure, cladding, uh, in internal finishes and everything in between. So if your stone is, is actually taking up a big chunk of that, those chapters need to be accumulated and they need to be equivalent that way, which is why that research project demonstrated it's actually cheaper to build in stone, cheaper still if you do the stone timber combination. Um, so yes, uh, that allowed me, us being the client, uh, meant that the client was e it was easier to, um, to, 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 to persuade or that, that we needed to ask the questions and wait for the answers and then challenge the rest of the design team that it was possible. So what we do now with our real clients, as it were, is uh, we, well in advance of those design team meetings, we ask people like Pierre, the, the, the people who provide the main... The main cost elements of the building, the superstructure, the substructure, the glazing systems, all the rest of it, we ask them well in advance for quotes. We then put those to the QS and the QS then has, instead of going back in time or has never worked with stone before, so he's guessing, he's got prices from the horse's mouth and, and the client is then convinced. Steve, over to you on sustainability. <laughs> Sorry. Um... I mean, there are a few things that I was going to pick up on before, before we got to sustainability. I mean, the one, the facade of Clerkenwell being structural, I think is really important. If that was non-structural, that would look like a highly uh, contrived bit of decoration on the front of the building. The fact that the facade is holding up the building, I think it's a key thing. Um, Buildings have to be more succinct. Cavity walls hung off of shelf angles, off of concrete frame, with 500 layers. This is not succinct. Succinct means one move that solves all the problems. Um, the stone is the facade, holds the building up. Um, sustainability is succinctness. Getting, a, getting rid of 500 unnecessary layers and boiling it down to one simple thing, that's sustainable. Um, the, the main thing with st stone is hugely abundant. I mean, there's everyone on the planet had a five by five meter, 200 millimeter thick stone slab. It would be a kind of 40 by 40 kilometer, 20 meter deep quarry. There's an enormous amount of stone. So stone is in effect an inexhaustible supply. Um, and 
yeah, the, the energy that's required to extract stone is very small. You know, you can use electrically driven diamond saws, you cut the stone out, the stone's very strong. If you compare stone to forestry, the amount of usable material that it takes, it takes 25 years to grow a tree to get one and a half cubic meters of usable timber with a strength of seven newtons, while underneath the tree would take you about two months to dig out 500 cubic meters of stone with a strength of 100 newtons. So it's a very effective. Um, but, unavailable it, material and you know we can build widely with stone a great strength and durable material um, without screwing up the environment in the place as we're currently doing with steel and concrete and aluminium and everything else i i, I just um I, I i just wanted to come back to to the state of the construction industry now and and to go back, in fact, to, to the to, to the to the theme of the of the talk, which is about you know collaboration. And um, I think what we can see in in the section of the building, the sandwich of material, it represents as well the segmentation of our trades and the way engineers are brought up a certain way, tradesmen are brought up a certain way, and and architects are brought up a certain way, and they don't talk to each other. And, and I think this, when you look at the segmentation, it, it's terrible what's happening to the construction industry because we just realized that we've been kept in some little cells, not talking to each other, not understanding each other. And it's suddenly when you meet around the table at the pub that, that suddenly, you know, I mean, ask the question, so can we get stone that length? And you say, yes, you can. And then, uh, I mean, looking at Steve saying, can you make it stand? Yes, of course. And And, and we just discovered that we could, straight from the beginning we, we could have done all these things just if we had talked earlier and i think it's in in the way we train young engineer the way we train all young craftsmen the way we train young architect they need we need to mingle we need to mm. to 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 mix a lot more to to for the craftsman to understand how an architect might work or an engineer and and and, and so that's you know we are all on the same page because if we if we are driven by new technology away from each other uh, yeah it's, it's going to be chaos managing I think. Well, sorry just quickly check um if i'm i know we're running over a little bit and if i've if i've missed any hands or because i'm trying to listen and look at the questions <laughs> that's so interesting um yeah that's fine i mean we we have time if you want to ask the uh, last few questions I well I, I wonder i think um there's uh one question here from Fed, uh, Fred Pilto, who asks, well, he says, uh, thank you for an inspiring presentation of a masterful project. Um, and he wonders how you see contemporary stone working tools and technologies opening up further possibilities um, and what's next for you. And I wonder if I can ask a final question as part of that is whether you know of any other projects in the pipeline that have taken your methodologies um, and are perhaps planning similar kind of um, working practice so that you, you know your your working relationship may have been expanded elsewhere i mean you are uh, trying to i, sorry, I think I'm, you are trying I'm, to show I'm some stuff trying to find so um yeah sorry my mute on no i'm not on mute. uh so uh yeah i mean you can see here that um uh, yeah as i said previously on our, our, Parkenwell is the megalithic 6,000 year old method of one stone on top of the other. Really, really simple and nothing more to it. And it's because we were just being, um, we were just expressing our learning, relearning of this, of this method. Here is something obviously a lot more complex. Using uh, uh, contemporary software that then goes to routing tools and cutting tools that can cut three dimensionally. Clearly, there's a lot of extra energy involved here and a lot of wastage of material. However, I'm not a believer that every single structure that we build ought to be um, as efficient as possible. General day-to-day -day building ought to be, but sometimes we need something um, extraordinary, special as a community. So there's, there's plenty of scope for special projects to use the most contemporary um, cutting tools and software to create what are still load-bearing stone um, uh, structures, but to be a bit more, um, what, have a bit more flair. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, making uh, gears on this as well. This is um, where you're using waste stone and bonding it. Uh, and if you look on the top left, uh, bonding it and laminating it uh, uh, while it's um, uh, loose, 
before you bond it, laying it across any mold. And then while it's bonded, it, it fixes in position and then becomes structural as well as, um, as well as a finish. Turn that into a sandwich panel with insulation, then what you've got is internal finish, external finish, insulation and structure at the same time. So yes, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fantastic future there for stone uh, using software, your imagination and these tools uh, that we, we're only beginning to touch on. So dare I say, at the AA, um, um, you know, I used to work at Zaha, so most of our, um, our intake was AA um, schooled, specifically um, <laughs> a couple of tutors. And uh, the shapes we came up with were, were often um, shapes, and uh, our engineer uh, uh, would say, uh, would basically engineer a structure underneath that shape, and then the, the shape would end up a couple of millimeters on the engineering. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think the challenge now is to say, uh, can that shape be the engineering at the same time? And of course it can. We just re need to learn, re relearn that. And perhaps Steve, is, Steve can come in at this point. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, um, I mean, for me, uh, you know, architecture being structure, the same thing, I think is really interesting. And I think, doing that with stone is uh is a fascinating thing and we try and push that kind of we try and push that kind of solution on all of our projects with you know with other architects and i think we've learned uh we've learned quite a lot and actually i think that the other i mean the other thing is when a, when a client wants to buy something or make something they want to know that there are various people out there that can can supply it so i think you know i've noticed other engineers are doing stone as well as us and i Personally, I think it's great that lots of different architects and engineers and different stone masons are all doing this. Um, but it might really catch on. Uh, for, for for me, um, as 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 a stone mason and 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 as a driver of reusing stone as load bearing material, um, with with all of us here, we we've got three or four different stone projects uh, going from um, a, a small a small house in the countryside to uh, some office building or even in industrial units we are building using stone and CLT um, using all the things that has been learned in the last 10 years um, so I, I think it's it's um, it's really down to the stone the, the stone mason the the stone fabricator um, to propose solutions that are unsustainable and elegant, of course. I mean, that's <laughs> that's architecture in a way <laughs> that I'm defining here. Um, but um, as well, again, for me, what was critical really for the last 15 years is really to 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 dialogue and and but, well, I'm French, so I have to talk. But to 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 dialogue and 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 understand what's the driving force of each engineer architect and of course clients <laughs> you know, not not forget the clients <laughs> in those all, all these things um and uh it, it, yes i i think it's um i i i do believe that you, nowadays you you go at your local tesco to get some milk there's not only milk there is soya milk there is coconut milk there is whatever milk you know i i think we we should look at architecture now and and the way we use material as as a lot more open and just not think of only one steel concrete and that's it and of course glass um but I, I think we are not preaching for only a stone architecture we are just preaching for uh an architecture du bon sens of of good thinking of 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 um <laughs> yeah just just uh logic architecture we would just um get a, a, a bit more um closer to, to, to its material um, and looking at different solution. That's it. Gosh, great. Well, what a lovely <laughs> way, way to conclude. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much to um, Pierre and Alan for such an interesting discussion and such a great project, and particularly to Steve as well for joining us. Thank you for, for that. Um, so I, I hope I've covered most of the questions. If not, I can um, try and do that um, afterwards um, mm -hmm. for a couple of points. But also just before we run over, and thank you so much for your patience because I know we're over time, just to remind you that next Monday um, – it, rather than have, unfortunately, we won't have two people in conversation. It will be Valentine talking about his work 
um, working relationship with Donald Judd. He was Donald Judd's fabricator from the 60s to the 90s. I think it'll be a really interesting conversation about um, authorship in a, in a different but related way. So I hope you'll join us then. And thanks so much once again for coming. Thank you for inviting us, uh, Juliet. Thank you to the AA to having Thank us. You. Such a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.